Good morning and welcome to Peace Haven, where our mission is to glorify God by equipping local members to make global disciples. If this is your first time with us, we're so glad that you're here. So make sure you stop by the new here stand out on the Welcome Center before you leave to pick up a free gift today. Men, make sure you sign up for the Iron Man Retreat. We're going to the Caraway Retreat Center on November 10th and 11th, and the cost is only $79 per person. And that covers one night of lodging, all meals, and activities. You can find out more details and sign up on the Church Center app, or you can stop by the Welcome Center desk if you need help. Trunk or Treat is right around the corner. We need several things. We need trucks, we need candy, and we need volunteers to help with the welcome area. So if you can go ahead and sign up for a trunk or for a volunteer position, or at least candy, go to the church signups on our Church Center app or do the sign-up sheet at the welcome desk. If you're new here or if you've been visiting for a while, Starting Point is the on-ramp to connect at Peace Haven. You'll get to meet our staff and learn more about our mission and vision. The next Starting Point class is November 3rd and 4th. That'll be a Friday night and a Saturday morning. If you'd like to sign up for Starting Point, you can do so via the Church Center app under signups, or you can just stop by the Welcome Center desk and we'll help you sign up there. Our launch bonfire night will be on Saturday, October the 21st from 6 to 9 p.m. down at the baseball field. We'll have food, s'mores, a bonfire, and a great time, so sign up for that on the Church Center app. Mark your calendars for Marriage Emphasis Sunday on October 22nd. Dr. Tate Cockle will be back with us for a session at our 10 a.m. worship service. Then he will do a second session after lunch in the kids' clubhouse. Food and child care will be provided for the afternoon session. If you plan to attend the afternoon session, please sign up for it on the Church Center app or stop by the Welcome Center desk to sign up there so we can adequately prepare for food and child care. November is National Caregivers Month, and we're hosting a caregivers brunch in honor of all those who sacrifice their time and energy to help care for someone in need. That includes professional caregivers and also anyone who gives their spouse, their parents, family members, or their friends the extra assistance that they require. It will be hosted by our I Can Cope Ladies Ministry and held at our gym on Saturday, November the 4th from 10 a.m. to 12 o'clock noon. Now again, we want to stress that this is for anyone who cares for someone who needs some extra help, even if you're not designated as the official caregiver. So if that describes you, sign up for it on the Church Center app or swing by the Welcome Center desk and we can help you sign up there. All right, Peace Haven, if you would, go ahead and stand with us as we prepare for worship today. Psalm 113, 2 and 3 says this, Let the name of the Lord be blessed both now and forever. From the rising of the sun to its setting, let the name of the Lord be praised. And that is what we are here to do today. So let's worship the Lord together through song.
presentation this morning. Let me get uh, Perry and Chuck, y'all to come on forward here. And Pastor John. And uh, where's Rebecca? She's back here. Okay. All right, wherever it is. Okay, so today we are honoring our lead pastor, and he leads, and we are so thankful to have him. I remember when we were on the pulpit committee, we were searching for a pastor, and one of the other people that we were looking at, he said, Jonathan is a leader. His leadership is unmatched, and we are so thankful that God has brought him to us. We're going to read uh, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. If y'all want to stand for the reading of God's word. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the Excuse me, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Now, Pastor Robert is going to 
talk to us a little bit about exhortation. And then Perry's going to talk to us for a few minutes about feeding the flock. And Chuck's going to talk to us a little bit about the example of the flock. So take it away there, Rob. Absolutely. So one of Pastor John's spiritual gifts is definitely exhortation. Um, when you look at the definition of exhortation, it's to urge, to encourage, to strengthen, to fortify, and even to at times rebuke with a future state of conduct in mind. That's the formal definition. So when I thought about that and thought what Pastor John meant to myself, my family, and probably many of you as well, I think there are three basic areas of exhortation that he covers. One is the courage to rebuke sin, to call it out. And in this day and age, um, that is becoming more of a rare and rare commodity. I think number two, to challenge each of us as sinners, to turn from that sin that so easily besets us. Sometimes we've grown complacent with it, and he will not allow us to be complacent. And I know I'm so thankful for that. And then lastly, to encourage us to live that best life uh, that God intended for us. And so ultimately, with rebuking sin, challenging us, and then encouraging us to walk down that path of discipleship. Um, John is exhibiting the love of God to all of us uh, by having us pull away from the sinful man and draw closer to the nature that God intended for us to have. Y'all can be seated if you want to. Uh, there, Perry. All right. <clears throat> Pastor John, I'd like to make you Hey, thank you for being here, for giving us the word, and for feeding us. And, uh, you know, the, the word is what keeps us, it's what uh, motivates us, it's what uh, gave us uh, the understanding of our sins. And I wrote down a few things I wanted to, to uh, just bring out as part of um, how the pastor uh, feeds us. And uh, first thing is he preaches the word. He's not afraid to preach the word. He takes the word. He expounds upon Jesus from the word. We all, all have times when we feel discouraged and down. And I've been in that position before and uh, have Pastor John to bring a word and it, it really inspired me and strengthened me uh, much like uh, uh, you know, we, uh, and we study the word and the Lord deals with us on it. I love the way that uh, he takes Bible characters and uh, to show us some of the life lessons that they had. <coughs> you know, uh, that's what the Bible does. He gives us the Bible, and as Pastor John brings the characters into life, we understand what was going on with them. And a lot of times it'll apply to us as well. And if they, through the Lord, can overcome those problems of life, so can you. Because the same God is with them, is with you. And he's no respecter of persons. Occasionally, while he's delivering the message, he will step on my toes. You've done that, Pastor. <laughs> the funny thing is, the first time he, he, they did that, I thought, man, he's tailoring that message, and he's pointing it right at me. No, it wasn't personal. But it, he wasn't uh, doing that, but it was the leadership of the Holy Spirit. As he would bring the message out, the Spirit of God would begin to prick my heart and touch me and say, hey, you need some work in this area. You need to change this. And if Pastor John was afraid to bring that out, I wouldn't know about it, perhaps. And uh, so it's very important that uh, sometimes step on your toes. Don't get offended. Look at it as the Lord trying to bring you around, trying to grow you in grace and mercy of our Lord. And it helps to sharpen us for the Master's use. The only way it can be sharpened is to go through that. Pastor John will always give people that, who need salvation the invitation to come and wash away their sins. Thank you, Pastor, uh, for doing that. I know the, his heart's desire is to see people saved. Uh, he's told me that many times. He really, his heart is really built on seeing people saved. That's our commission. That's our de determination. It's what God uh, developed the church for, to go and, and preach the gospel. And so whosoever will may come and drink of the water of life freely. And you can't do that the word is proclaimed unless the invitation is brought forth and finally pastor john when preaching points us to jesus the chief shepherd uh, jesus is after all the, the in every passage of the word 
in every man and woman's heart who have received salvation. Jesus is the living God. And Pastor John wants all of us to know and serve him as our Lord. Thank you, Pastor John. So, so 1 Peter 5, verse 3 says, Not lording over those entrusted in your care. Not lording over like a leader with an iron fist. It's my way or the highway. Not a gunslinger. I'm going to shoot first and ask questions later. Not somebody who makes decisions where they have all the facts that matter. Karma of being an example to people. That's what Peter is telling elders, pastors, the spiritual leaders of the church. Be an example to the flock by not lording over your people. I think I appreciate Pastor John, his ability to listen to a matter, he seeks the truth on all sides. Mm -hmm. He doesn't want to jump to an abrupt decision. Bam, I've made this decision. Oh, I didn't have all the facts. I shouldn't have decided that. He's not that kind of leader. He's being an example to the flock by being slow to speak, quick to listen. I just want to say I appreciate you. Appreciate your example in the church. Amen. You know, Pastor John, you lead the flock. You know, Jesus is our shepherd, and he leads us beside the still waters. And you, through the word of God, take us to those still waters, to the peace. That we have in him you're the under shepherd he's the chief shepherd and you know that and you know that you you are only what you are because of him and that's why your ministry is so effective mr becca when i think about being spirit filled i think about you because you think about the Fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That's Rebecca. She's like her mama. She has that. She's spirit-filled. And we're so thankful for that. You know, uh, Pastor John has some sayings. We all benefit from those sayings, don't we? We were talking our, with our D group Sunday night, and I was asking them about some of the sayings. But one of them is, and y'all try to help me out. I will start it and you finish it, okay? If it's black and white, we get it right. That's right. Well, what's that saying? Why does he say that? Because he's, he's promoting the Word of God, and he's teaching us that that's what's important. What does God say about it? If it's if it's something that's questionable, what's God's principles toward it, right? And then there's uh, spiritual gravity. What is spiritual gravity? It puts it in your mind, and it drops in your heart. And, of course, Miss Rebecca does a lot of that, right? Because she's putting it in those little minds, and eventually it's going to drop in their heart. And that's what we're believing by faith. Now there's another one. If you can't fix it, it's not your problem. Whose problem is it? It's God's problem, right? So God's fixing it, and that's teaching us to just trust in the Lord. It's something that you don't have control over, so you just trust in the Lord. And then there's, uh, I know none of you will get this one, being on God's agenda right how has that changed your life when you think about being on god's agenda all of us in here if we're listening to the holy spirit at all and i hear it all the time i mean talking with you folks we it comes up being on god's agenda being on god's agenda and that helps us to stay in the fight you know i was thinking about uh just a just a few weeks ago, I was, well, actually just 
it's been a couple months, but I was with one of my customers. I was sharing the gospel with them. And he says, yeah, I talked to Pastor John in the sauna over at the Y. So he's on God's agenda. He's being an example, right? And that happens many times where I'm talking to someone, and yeah, John has already shared the gospel with them. And I was thinking a little bit about back in August, I, was, I left the house and was going uh, to an appointment, and about a mile from my house, I come into a curve there and there's a there's an accident and there's a pickup upside down with the cab crushed in there had been a head-on collision and the man in the truck didn't make it and seeing that man and trying to get him out of the vehicle and seeing the flames coming up from the truck. It's just something you can't unsee. And that man, I got to looking back through my notes and I had been to his house back in February, adopted by way. So that man had told me that he, when he got saved and what church he attended, and I got to thinking, God, what are you trying to do here? What are you trying to work out here? And as I continued to visit on that byway, a few weeks later we met this man's sister. And we asked her, Jenny and I, we asked her, is there something we can help you pray about? And she says, yes, I just lost my brother. And we were able to comfort her and pray with her and minister with her. And then we talked to another person in the neighborhood. And he was friends with the one who lost his life in the vehicle. And we were able to lead him to Christ. And then we went back out there to follow up. And his son prayed and asked Christ to come in his heart. And that's all because Pastor John says, okay, I'm going to put you guys on God's agenda. And hopefully you're working your byway and you're seeing what God's doing. So, thank you for challenging us and keeping it in front of us. And now, here's another one. It's an audience of what? One. one. Hebrews 12, 1, through 1 and 2 tells us, Wherefore, being compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset you. And let us run with patience or endurance the race that is set before us. We see you. We, sh we see you running your race. We see you when you lose, lost your sister. And how you responded. And the example that you were. We see you, Rebecca, when you lost your brother. It was such a hard time to go through. But we see you running your race. We see you not quitting, not giving up, but even becoming more and more Christ-like. I can honestly sit here and say that you too have shown more endurance in the last year or two than I ever imagined. God is growing you and working in you, and we see it. And we see you running your race. You know, just yesterday was the two-year anniversary on Pastor John, um, his dad going to heaven. But we see you, and you're an example for us. 
So here's one more. If you're leading and no one's following, what? Remember that one? You're just taking a walk. If you're leading and no one's following, you're just taking a walk. So let me ask you, if you have received Christ since 2010, if you would stand up for me if you if you'd received Christ since 2010. Okay, and I want you to remain standing. Okay. Now, if you have started attending, <coughs> excuse me, have started attending Peace Haven <coughs> since 2010, stand up <coughs> and remain standing. I don't think he's just taking a walk. When the chief shepherd shall appear, who's that? Jesus. Then <clears throat> you are going to receive a crown of glory that fades not away. And I praise the Lord for that. So everybody stand if you would. And Jenny, if you want to bring that. And I think it would be appropriate to give them a big hand of applause. Well, um, I don't know what to say. Uh, I, I, I'll just say this. I'm so thankful for these men, and I'm happy to stand here. And it, it, men, if you will, ask your wives to come forward with you um, because I want to do something here myself, if I can. And um, again, thank you all so much for this. Thank you so much just uh, for, uh, y'all can be seated, but thank you all so much for just uh, accepting us, loving us, and uh, yes. Oh, they got something else for Miss Rebecca. All right, I, I cut in too early. Y'all notice John said all these nice things about me, and then he said, now when I think about spirit field, though, I think about Miss yeah. Rebecca. Did y'all notice? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> and I, I, do not, I do not disagree. I will say this. I've, I've said this so many times. She's the perfect pastor's wife. And uh, there is, there's, and I think y'all probably know that. Uh, but, uh, you know, a couple years ago, we started praying about uh, changing our church polity a little bit. Uh, and we have a, uh, a plural eldership. And what that simply means, we have a staff, and y'all have honored us as a staff. But uh, I'd be derelict to my duty if I didn't honor these men and these women. Uh, of course, Tammy can't be with us today. She's horribly backslidden. Y'all pray for her. Uh, no, she's actually out serving the Lord in another capacity. And so, Tammy, if you're watching, thank you so much. But what I want to do today is simply this. Hold it. All right. All right. So, but what I want to do today is this. I just want to say thank you. You know, I know we're kind of new at this. We're kind of evolving. We're trying to still figuring it out how this works for us. And uh, y'all have been so patient with me uh, as we've tried to, you know, work through this. But you know, I've, I've mentioned to this, this is Pastor Chuck and, of course, Miss Rachel. This is Pastor Perry and Miss Elisa. This is Pastor Robert and, of course, Tammy uh, is, is out serving. And then this is Pastor John Hoots and this is Miss Jenny. And they have been so faithful. That's why, that's why that the Lord has called them to this capacity. We didn't call them to this capacity. God called them to this capacity. And so I want to today uh, show appreciation for them because, again, they have helped me so much just in the, the short amount of time. And these ladies, these ladies serve uh, like no other. And so today, Pastor John Hoots, I want to give you this as appreciation from our church. And of course, you know, Pastor Chuck, I'm going to go, you and Rachel have been a blessing to us in ways I cannot even begin uh, to say. Rachel, you know, just uh, I could say so much. And uh, then of course, Pastor Robert, and we've already given Miss Tammy. And then Pastor Perry, you've been a blessing to me. Thank you so much uh, for your friendship. 
and I believe we have some flowers as well coming. But these, uh, once again, I'll say these men, these ladies, they've been a great asset to our church and just a great asset for me. And as we go through this, I pray that God continues to use us and uh, to bless us. Kelly, Miss Kelly, thank you so much for helping us out. Would you give these guys and these ladies a hand today <laughs> as well? All right. Thank you all so much. Pastor Jared. You can go ahead and stand with us this morning as we prepare for some more corporate worship through song. Uh, so around here, we talk about the gospel a lot. You know, we, Pastor John preaches about the gospel week in and week out. We sing the gospel. Uh, we speak the gospel into each other's lives. And it's so important because that's how we grow. You know, the gospel is simply the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection. And one of the things that I think about on Pastor Appreciation Month is I think about the way that Pastor John lives a gospel-centered life. And a gospel-centered life is just a life that says, I'm a sinner in need of God's mercy, relating to other sinners who are in need of God's mercy. And one of the things that Pastor John says quite often is he's just a beggar telling other beggars where to find. Yes, there's another saying for you, right? And I've been able to witness that over these past five years that I've had the opportunity to serve on staff here at Peace Haven. And Pastor John has set an incredible example for me and, of course, for our church. And we think about this today. We want to focus in on the chief shepherd. And so often we are able to see the chief shepherd through the flawed efforts of the under shepherds, right? We know that we're not perfect. And Pastor John says that if you have come through starting point, that's one of the main things he tells you. He says, I will fail you at some point. And as human beings, we will. We will fail you. We will let you down. But he also says, if you let him know, he'll make it right. And I have seen that. I've witnessed that in his life. But here's the thing today. We know the one who will never fail us, right? Jesus Christ will never fail us. And he went to the cross, and he took our place on the cross, and he died in our place on the cross so that we could have a relationship with God the Father, an eternal relationship, eternal life. And so today we're going to sing that. We're going to sing about what he's done and let's lift it up to him and let's praise him today for all that he has done.
this morning. Let's pray, church. Father, once again, we come to you boldly, not because of anything that we've done or any merits that we have, but because the one who is worthy has redeemed us. God, we bless you for all the blessings that you've poured down on us for forgiving us of our sins, from healing us from our diseases, from redeeming us from our life in the pit. God, you satisfy us with everything that we need. Only you can satisfy, truly. God, you are merciful, you're gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. As far as the east is from the west, you have redeemed moved our transgressions against you. God, we praise you. We praise you for giving us leaders in this church, for giving us my dad, Pastor John, for the example he's been to me, not only in, uh, in a church capacity, but also at home, being able to see his example lived out day in and day out from morning to night. God, I praise you for that, for giving me that and forgiving us as a church, as a body, him as our pastor. God, thank you for the other elders. Thank you for Jared Hoots and everything. Just all the blessings. We have such great leadership here. We don't want to take that for granted. Thank you once again. We praise you for everything. Thank you again for redeeming us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I do... Uh, I do look forward to October because uh, I'm so grateful, you know, for you guys, and, and, I'm, and I'm thankful for how that you, you know, show your appreciation during this month, and, and I know you appreciate us year-round. I know you appreciate Jared Bowman, Pastor Jared, and our elder team, our deacon team, uh, so many other people, you know, that make this place go around, and, and again, we, we say this all the time. We want to make sure we, re we reiterate it. Uh, this, this place is built around one person. Uh, but he doesn't have skin on, at least not our skin. He's seated at the right hand of the Father today. His name is Jesus Christ. And so today, I appreciate the fact that you appreciate us. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we wouldn't none of us have anything if it wasn't for him. Amen? And so today we're in Ruth. Uh, if you will, go to Ruth chapter 3. We'll be looking at Ruth uh, chapter 3 today. And as you turn in there, we've been kind of going through, we did a Ruth series some time ago here in, in the auditorium. And then I decided to teach through Ruth over in uh, Wednesday nights. And I kind of ran out of time because y'all know I'm having, uh, having open heart surgery on Tuesday. And uh, I appreciate so much y'all reaching out. I just want to say this, you know, I'm going to turn my phone off on Tuesday uh, for obvious reasons. And it'll be off for several days and maybe off for a couple of weeks. And uh, you can contact me through Rebecca and, of course, uh, through the church office. Our pastoral staff will be available to you. Our elder team and our deacon team will be available to you. 
And um, I would ask this, uh, they don't want me to have visitors for a while just simply because they don't want me to get sick, and I know none of you would come if you thought you were, uh, but you know, sometimes you're sick and you don't know you're sick. How many of y'all ever been sick and didn't know you were sick? All right, well, uh, that could happen. And so I appreciate your prayers. I do have a saying for you, though. You never see God coming. You can always see where he's been. So I don't know what's going on with this thing. You know, it's just kind of hit me uh, out of left field. And I have no idea. It's kind of been blindsided a little bit. But I do know this. I am on God's agenda. And Tuesday I'll be on God's agenda. And I'll still be on God's agenda, right? So no matter what happens, I'm on God's agenda. And so I just have to go into it understanding that. All right, we're going to talk about this. A worthy redeemer today. A worthy redeemer. Two, two outstanding traits seem to epitomize the world we now live in. I've told you this before. If we could describe our world today, one of the words we'd have to use is offended. Everybody's offended, and they're offended sometimes, you know, for no no real reason. It's just sometimes people are looking for ways to be offended, and it seems to be due to political incorrectness as it's been dubbed. But not only are people offended, but we're impatient people. We're offended people, and we are impatient people. We want faster food. We want faster travel. We want faster computers. We want faster checkout lines. We think the world, whole world has come to an end if more than two people are in front of us in the grocery store at the checkout line. I mean, all the world is coming to an end. And God forbid that somebody should have 13 items at the 12-item only register. And we're counting them as they're coming across, aren't we? And we can't even talk about the people who pay with a check. Especially the people who wait until they tell how much it is before they go digging into the deep recesses of their purse to find that check. And by the way, what are the two worst words in the checkout line? Price check. Because then you know you're looking for another line to get into. And you know, we just don't want to wait for anybody or for anything. And it's because of this. We have a, what I'm going to call a wait problem, W-A-I-T. I've got a wait problem. I'm sure you do too. Quite possibly the person who frustrates us the most regularly, they, regularly though, are not people. I get more frustrated with God than I do with people. And, and, and I shouldn't because I should trust him so much that I don't mind waiting. And yet sometimes God really does put us in a place to where we're waiting and we're like, Lord, why are we having to wait? Psalm 27, 14, well, a very popular verse. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart. He says, wait, I say, on the Lord. Now, as we get to the book of Ruth, the opening five verses introduce us to a man of impatience. His name is Elimelech. And what Elimelech does is Elimelech, when, he fi- when there's a famine in Bethlehem, God's place of provision, the house of bread, he leaves Bethlehem, the, the place, God's place of provision. Now, keep in mind, this is during a time of the judges when every man is doing that which is right in his own eyes. And, of course, Elimelech, he fits that bill because he thinks to himself, we can have bread down in Moab, and God can't take care of us here in Bethlehem. So because of his impatience, he experiences horrible, horrible consequences. Elimelech failed to wait on God, and three deaths later, his and his two sons, his impatience had rendered dire and devastating consequences. But now, when we get to this place in in the book of Ruth, what God has done is God has brought Elimelech's wife, Naomi, and his da- one of his daughter, daughters-in-law, Ruth, back to Bethlehem. Now, you remember, the Bible says she left full and, or, and she come back empty. She left a wife and a mother. She came back, of course, you know, uh, with no husband, no children, and really in her mind, no prospects of any kind of future. Can I remind you of something? No matter how dire your situation is, even no matter how bad the, uh, bad the decisions that you've made, if you're still breathing, God's grace is still working. And you may think I have no future, you may think I have absolutely no prospects of ever serving out my my purpose for God, and I want to tell you this, you might have messed it up a little bit, and you might have redirected some things, because we all have because of our sin, but here's what we know at the end of the day, God is still working. All things are working together for good to them who love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. So Naomi is there in Moab. She's been there for 10 years. She comes back. She's not 10 years older. She's probably 20 or 30 years older according to her countenance. But she's been gone for 10 years. But God has a plan. And that's what we're going to see. In God's guidance, Ruth is found gleaning in Boaz's field. And here's the great thing about Boaz. Boaz is smitten with Ruth. When Naomi hears of Boaz's interest in Ruth, her wheels start turning. And this is what she tells Ruth. She says, Ruth, even though you're a Moabitess, here's the thing. At the end of this barley harvest, I want you to wash yourself. I want you to anoint yourself. I want you to dress yourself. And I want you to present yourself. And here's what Ruth does. Ruth does exactly what Naomi says to do. 
And what she does is she waits until Boaz fell asleep. After winnowing, she tiptoes to the mound of grain where Boaz was laying, and she lays at his feet. And at midnight, now I know some of you are thinking, man, this is horrible. What is going on here? Well, culturally, this is acceptable. At midnight, Boaz, he awakens to find Ruth at his feet. And when he finally realizes who Ruth is, he makes it quite obvious, you know, you know uh, that he's glad she's there. And no doubt Boaz is flattered. He's overjoyed that Ruth wants to marry him because that's basically what Ruth is doing. Remember, Ruth is a Moabitess. She was married to Malon. Remember, Elimelech had two sons, Malon and Chilion. They're dead. Elimelech's dead. They come back. Ruth comes back. Orpah goes back to her religion, back to her relatives. Ruth says, your God's going to be my God. Your people are going to be my people. Naomi sends her out to glean. She goes and she gleans. She ends up in Boaz's field by, of course, the providence and the sovereignty of God. And here is Ruth. And Ruth is here, you know, and, and, and she's basically, at Naomi's instruction, at the end of the barley harvest, she basically is asking Boaz to marry her. And when he finds out who it is, he's, it's quite obvious. He, he's glad she is there. And because Boaz is a near kinsman, we'll talk about this a little bit, to Elimelech, he can marry Ruth, and he can redeem the property that they've lost, and he can produce a son with Ruth that will perpetuate the bloodline of Elimelech and Malon, Ruth's deceased husband. Naomi is, of course, deceased, uh, deceased husband as well. But there is a problem. Because the law of the Redeemer in the Old Testament Jewish economy required that the closest kinsman must have first choice. Now, here's how this works, okay? What, what, what they want to happen, what Naomi wants to happen, is she wants her daughter-in-law, Ruth, who is now a widow, to marry Boaz... Because Boaz, as a near kinsman, he can redeem the property and carry on the bloodline. And that's very important. In Jewish economy, bloodline and property, very important things. And so this is very, very significant as we read about this. But there is a problem because in the law of the Redeemer in the Old Testament Jewish economy, it required that the closest kinsman, remember, Boaz is a near kinsman, but he's not the closest kinsman that's alive. The nearest kinsman, which is probably Elimelech's brother in this story, he is the one who has first choice. And Boaz is apparently second in line. So let's read Boaz's response to Ruth's proposal. Chapter 3, look at verse 10. Remember, Ruth has just laid at his feet. She's basically said, hey, let's get married. And this is what he says in verse 10. Then Boaz said, Blessed are you of the Lord, my daughter, for you have shown more kindness at the end than at the beginning, and that you did not go after the young men, whether rich, poor, or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear, fear not. I will do for you all that you request, for all the people of my town know that you are a virtuous woman. She's already built a testimony. Now, it is true that I am a close relative. However, here's the problem. There is a relative closer than I. Remember, law of the Redeemer has got to go to the first, uh, first in line. He says this, stay this night. Now, remember, nothing sordid is going on here. I'll explain that in a minute. And in the morning, it shall be that if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives. He says, lie down until morning. Now, I have to have a great, uh, show a great appreciation here for Boaz's reverence for God and for God's word. Boaz doesn't try to manipulate the scripture to fit his agenda. We do that so often. Boaz could have said, well, I'm not the nearest kinsman, but I'm close, so let's get married. He doesn't do that. He honors God's word. He wants to marry Ruth. He wants to redeem the property. But God has a protocol in place that God expects to be honored. And can I say this today? God still expects his word to be honored. God still calls on us to trust him. Not to manipulate Scripture to fit our own narrative or to fit our own agenda, but to be on God's agenda by following God's Word just as it is written. As Pastor John Hoot said a while ago, when it's black and white, well, what? we got to get it right. Well, that's what's going on with Boaz. It's black and white. He knows what's in the the law of the Redeemer, and he's going to follow it to the very T, trusting that God will work it out. God has a protocol in place. God expects that protocol to be honored. And Boaz understands that God's blessing is contingent often in our, uh, 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 on our obedience. Ladies and gentlemen, today, let's be reminded of that. There's so many times we want God's blessing, but we don't want to exert obedience toward God. Let's be reminded, God's blessing in many cases is contingent on our obedience. So I'm sure that Ruth here, I'm sure she appreciates Boaz's commitment to Scripture. God's will, God's way. Deuteronomy 25, just to give you some clarity here. If bro- this is kind of the law of the Redeemer, okay? If brothers dwell together 
and one of them dies and has no son, which is what's happened here, the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. But what happens? Her husband's brother shall go in to her. In this case, that's going to be Elimelech, because Malon's brother's dead. And so this is Elimelech. Her husband's brother shall go into her, take her as his wife, and perform the duties of a husband's brother to her. Now watch this. Next. Is there another verse? And it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. See what's going on here. See, she marries a near kinsman. They have a son, and the son carries the name of her dead husband. But if the man does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate of the elders and say, my husband's brother refuses to do this, all right? So raise up a name to his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. So that kind of gives you an idea as to what's going on here with the law of the Redeemer. According to Moses, the brother or the closest male relative of the deceased man was to take on this responsibility, so Boaz must consult the closer kinsman, the closest kinsman, before he can perform the act of, of redeeming the property and the bloodline. So in essence, Boaz tells Ruth, he says that word that we all hate, wait. The word we hate is wait. Now I want you to see the patience. Look at verse 13, because there is patience there. He says this, he says, stay this night, and in the morning it shall be, if he will perform the duty of a close relative for you, good, let him do it. But if he does not want to perform the duty for you, then I will perform the duty for you as the Lord lives, lie down until morning. Now you can see here, Boaz wishes to marry Ruth, but here's what he does. He says, I'm going to wait. I remember one of my sayings, you'll like it. The only thing worse than waiting on God is wishing you had. The only thing worse than waiting on God is wishing that you had. Because Boaz could have jumped the gun, Boaz could have jumped out, and he could have done what he thought God would have wanted him to do. Here's the thing, God will never call you to do something that's in contradiction to what he's already told you to do. Now, what I mean by that is this, if God's already told you in his word, don't do this or do this, he's not going to come back and say, okay, you know, I've changed my mind. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's immutable, and his word is immutable. So Boaz is very patient. He trusts God's wisdom, and he honors God's word. He moves into action, but he's trusting God all along. So number one, that's Boaz's patience. Number two, notice the protection. Verse 14. Our Bible says here in verse 14, So, here's what Ruth does. She laid at his feet until morning, and she arose before no one could recognize another. Then Boaz said, Do not let it be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. I do like this about Boaz. In his protection in verse 13, Boaz implores Ruth to lay down until the next morning. And then here in verse 14, you know, kind of see how, how this thing plays out. The question is, why would he do that? Well, for at least two reasons. Two reasons that I can find. First of all, her physical protection. According to verse 8, this conversation occurred at midnight. This is a very dangerous, remember, this is the time of the judges when a lot of people are doing that which is right in their own eyes, and a lot of men out there are kind of sorted in their actions. So clearly Boaz understood the kind of characters who were wondering about, uh, you know, about, about this time at night. Ruth would have been an easy target for an attack. So what Boaz is doing here, more or less, is he's protecting her body. But secondly, he's also protecting her reputation. According to verse 14, Boaz saw her off early enough that morning to where few people, if any, would even know that she was there that night. Now again, nothing immoral has gone on here. Nothing was ever going to go on. That's not why Ruth is there. But here's Boaz. Boaz says, number one, I'm going to protect you physically because I really do not want you being out there and some, some crazy guy, you know, uh, attacking you. But number two, I'm going to protect your reputation. I don't want people to know that you were here because even though there's nothing going on here, somebody will say there was. I want you to notice, thirdly, his provision, verse 15. Also, he said, bring the shawl that is on you and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six ephahs of barley and laid it on her. Then the Bible says she went into the city. Now, characteristic of a Boaz in his kindness, here's what he does. He fills Ruth's veil, her shawl with barley, six ephahs, or a little less than four bushels uh, in our units of measure. Now, in all of this, here's what we're learning. Everybody in this story is forced to wait. Everybody has a wait problem. Boaz has to wait until he can receive word from the near kinsman and his intentions. Naomi, well, she's back home waiting to see what has happened because she sent Ruth basically to propose marriage and now Ruth hasn't come home and didn't come home all night. So finally she hears and she sees someone approaching. Verse 16, it's kind of interesting. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi, she said, 
is that you, my daughter? Then she told her all that the man, all that Boaz had done for her. Now, you can kind of uh, imagine her relief. As Ruth comes back, finally she arrives home the next morning, and Ruth, no doubt, enthusiastically shared every... How many of y'all know? Uh, you know, when you get around, you hear, you hear about somebody getting engaged. You know, the women get together, and first thing, they've got to hold the ring up. Well, wrong, I'm sorry, wrong hand. You've got to hold the ring up, you know, show everybody the ring, and then, oh, I want to hear all about it. I want to hear every detail. So you can kind of imagine these two women, as they get together, Naomi's saying, what did he look like? What did he say? How did he respond? You know, the whole thing, going through the whole thing, you know, and just enjoying every detail of it. So Naomi then says those dreadful words, again, that nobody wants to hear. He says, she says this. She says, sit still. Look at verse 18. Sit still. She said to Ruth, sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will turn out. For the man will not rest until he has concluded the matter this day so Boaz is waiting Naomi's waiting and Ruth is now forced to wait Psalm 46 10 says this y'all know this verse be still and know that I am God be still and know that I am God I can't I can't emphasize this point anymore to myself or to you today is that in whatever is going on in your life there's so many times when we, would, we, we want to move ourselves so quickly to action. And, and I can't emphasize enough that sometimes God just wants us to close our mouths and be still and let him do his thing. Because I can tell you this, his thing's a lot better than your thing or my thing. When he's doing his thing, get out of the way of his thing and let him do it. Because his thing is going to work together for good. Your thing is going to work together for a mess. How many times have you done your thing and God has to come back and do his thing to fix your thing? There's a great quote for you. I can't say it again, but it's great. Because that's so true. When we're doing our thing, we can mess it up. So here, here, here's what needs to happen right here. Ruth, you sit still and know he's God. Naomi, she's going to sit still and know he's God. Now, what's Boaz doing? Boaz is not sitting still, but he's trusting God. Here's what he's doing. He's doing what he knows he has to do in order to honor God. And so you see all the waiting that's going on here. Psalm 46.10 said, be still. Know that I am God. And I trust that today that you're doing that. Now, let's change gears for a second because here's, here's our point today. Of the whole book of Ruth, what we're doing is we're leading up to a worthy redeemer. Now, when I use the term worthy, I don't have this for you today, but I'm going to give you a definition. Worthy simply means this. It means possessing the qualities that merit recognition in a special way or a specified way. Possessing the qualities that merit recognition in a very special, in a very unique, in a very specified way. Today, we connect the, the, the term worthy as an adjective to a noun that tells the story of our deliverance from slavery of sin. That term today is this, and it's the title of our message, Worthy Redeemer. Worthy Redeemer. As you can imagine, a redeemer is one who redeems. Uh, Brother Jared, a while ago, just said that very thing as he was uh, so eloquently bragging on his father i hope we got that prayer uh, on recorded so i can play it back this afternoon 100 times but i do appreciate that but it's talking about our redemption what is redemption it means to be bought back in in our case we were slaves to sin and the blood of jesus paid the price for our redemption that we could be bought back out of that slavery and so it's a beautiful thing so when we talk about a worthy redeemer, we're talking about a redeemer who redeems, but he has to be worthy. And by definition, redemption, again, is re the regaining of something lost in exchange for full payment of a debt. Christ paid our debt. Now, for the sake of Old Testament information, I'm going to give you quickly three types of Jewish redemption specified in the law of Moses. I'm not going to preach these, but I'm going to give them to you. Number one, slavery. Redeemed from slavery. Now, what that simply means, and I'm getting this from Leviticus 25 and Deuteronomy 25, if you want to write that down and read about it later. But if a man in economic des desperation, he sold himself into slavery, here's what can happen. His brother, if his brother has the money, can come and buy him out. Now, also, redemption from poverty. For example, if a man sells his property in economic desperation, his brother, as we've been talking about, can come back, and he can buy it, of course. And then, redemption from the grave. A man's name, as we've been talking about, can be perpetuated 
by a near kinsman who marries the widow and produces a son with her. In our story, Elimelech is dead. In our story, Ruth's husband, Malon, Elimelech, Elimelech and Naomi's son is dead also. The other son, Chilion, he's dead. So there are no sons to carry on the family name. So Boaz wishes to fulfill the role of kinsman redeemer. That's what's happening here. But is he truly qualified? Is he truly qualified? Well, let's talk about three things that qualifies the Redeemer. Number one, he's worthy. He's got to be worthy. We'll talk about it in a second. Number two, he's got to be wealthy. Number three, he's got to be willing. Those three things have to be true. Number one, he's got to be worthy. He has to be worthy. What do I mean by that? He has to be, according to the law of the Redeemer, a close relative. Number two, he's got to be wealthy. And we, of course, know he's got to be rich. He's got to have the money. And then here's the thing, and this is the clincher, he's got to be willing. He's got to be willing. So here's the question. Is the nearer kinsman that Boaz is going to see, if he's going to be the worthy, if he's going to be the redeemer, number one, he has to be worthy. Well, he's worthy. We already know that because he's the brother. Number two, he's got to be wealthy. Well, apparently he is wealthy or else Boaz wouldn't be going to see him in the first place. The last thing is this, though. Is he willing? Chapter 4, verse 1. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, come aside, friend, sit down here. So he came aside, and the Bible says he sat down. Verse 2, and he took, took uh, ten men of the elders of the, of the city and said, sit down here. So they came, and the Bible says they sat down. So as he promised Ruth, remember what he said? He said, you go home, I'll go take care of this. So he, he meets with the unnamed relative. Furthermore, he sets up a court proceeding among the elders at the gate of the city to ensure the the legal legitimacy of this ruling. Verses verses 3 and 4. Then he said to the close relative, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So see, she has sold it. She's lost it. And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know, for there is no one but you to redeem it. And I am next, I'm going to say next, and I'm going to add here, I'm next in line. I'm next after you. And he said, here it is, I will redeem it. Now, here's the thing. Boaz is speaking here about real real estate. And, And he presents his case. I'm not convinced that the real estate is the heart of this matter for Boaz. Boaz has, he, he has, you know, fields. He has, this is not really specifically for him anyway. i tell you what he's concerned about. He's concerned about Ruth. Ruth is his primary concern. So Boaz is so ha- hoping that the unnamed relative will display no interest whatsoever in redeeming the property. But to his d- complete dismay, to his utter chagrin, the man says, I will redeem it. Boaz's heart must have fell in his stomach. Because he could care less about the land, most likely. All he cares about is, hey, listen, he has fallen in love with this woman. He swallows that lump in his throat, and the Bible says he proceeds. Verse 5, notice what he says. I'm sure he's not showing his hand. He's keeping his cards close to his vest here, but you know that he's sad about it. Boaz said, on the day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. So the question in verse 5 is this. Is the man worthy? Well, he's a close kinsman. Is the man wealthy? Well, of course he is. He says, I can buy it. Here's the big clincher. Here's the question. Boaz says, are you willing to marry Ruth the Moabitess? Verse 6. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything, one man took off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was a confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So the Bible says he took off his sandal. Apparently, marrying Ruth was the deal breaker. Now, I don't know if it had to, some of it may have had to do with the fact, did you notice that Boaz says, you got to marry Ruth, that Moabitess, (laughs) <laughs> Did you hear that? <laughs> that old Moabitess. I don't think he said it that way. But you've got to marry Ruth, the Moabitess, if you're going to redeem the land. And that to this man was too much of a sacrifice. I mean, the man understood from the law that to marry Ruth was to obligate the firstborn son that they have together 
to carry the names of Elimelech and Malon. And perhaps, and I think this is what the Bible is really indicating here, I think he feared the risk of a son, not of his own name, inheriting his land and his possessions, and of all things, for it to be the son of a Moabitess named Ruth. So here's what Boaz says. Boaz says, deal or no deal, man? And the unnamed relative says, no deal. Suddenly. At least, not in, not, not in its fullness, but the semblance of Deuteronomy 25, the man took off his shoe and handed it to Boaz. And technically, uh, this procedure was a bit more harsh and embarrassing in Deuteronomy 25. Look what Deuteronomy 25 actually says that's supposed to happen. If the man does not want, remember this is the unnamed relative, if he does not want to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate to the elders and watch this, watch what she's supposed to do, and say, My husband's brother refuses to raise up a name to his brother in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. This gets harsh. Then the elders of the city shall call him and speak to him. But if he stands firm and says, I do not want to take her, then his brother's wife shall come to him in the presence of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot, spit in his face and answer and say, so shall it be done to the man who will not build up his brother's house. And his name shall be, uh, his name shall be called in Israel, the house of him who has his sandal removed. Don't you kind of like this guy? He says, he says, you know what? I'm not going to do it. Here, here's my sandal. Right? I'll just spare you, I'll just spare you the trouble. Here's my sandal. You know? and, and, of course, we have no um, record of Ruth coming and spitting in his face and so on and so forth. But that, that's kind of what that is talking about there. But the man more or less saved Ruth the trouble of publicly denouncing him, and Boaz graciously complies. Boaz is... Hey, listen, Bo, Boaz could care less. He's too busy fist pumping, man. I mean, he's happy about this thing. Look at verse 9. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Chilion's and all that was Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren, and from his position at the gate. You are witnesses this day. And you can kind of hear the banging of the gavel. Case closed. Case closed. Now you say, Pastor John, you know, what what are we taking from this today? Well, I do need you to understand something. Boaz, in this story, and I know we've gone through it very quickly today. But if you don't get anything else, get this. In this story... Boaz is somewhat representative of our kinsman redeemer. When we talk about our kinsman redeemer, here's what we're talking about. We are talking about Jesus. You say, wait a minute, how is he our kinsman? Well, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Directly a kinsman with Israel because he's the lion, as we sang this morning, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. The lion of the tribe of Judah. Right now, we are watching some things unfold internationally that I believe have very significant prophetic ramifications right now I am a little disturbed and and I know it's through ignorance some of it historical ignorance some of it theological ignorance but but you know there are people today condemning Israel not understanding and I'm not going to get too political and the reason I haven't is because it kind of makes me mad and it's going to make you mad too. If I get mad, you're going to get mad probably because I know what I'm going to say is going to be angering. So I'm not going to say it. Hopefully. But there is a difference between Hamas and their approach and Israel and their approach. And if you're paying close attention, Hamas is using the character of Israel to their advantage because they know they'll use, they'll use innocent people as human shields, but Israel will not. And the world, for whatever reason, is not understanding that. I have stood in that kibbutz right there on that border. I stood there in March. I was standing as close as I am to Kim right there from the wall that separates Gaza from Israel. I was in zone one. What that means is this. That means if the rocket went off and the alarm went off, I had about two seconds to get into the bomb shelter. I was looking up over the 29-foot wall, and I saw the tower, and there was a man from Hamas looking back at me. Saw him on eyes. 
And very easily, that day could have been the day, and don't think that they hadn't been planning this for a long time, and don't think Iran is not behind it. There are always going to be, Hezbollah is going to get in on this, Syria may get in on this, Jordan may get in on this, all those surrounding countries. But here's what I know. I know that the lion of the tribe of Judah is still defending his people. And so today, we stand with Israel because God stands with Israel. Now let's understand something, because this is hard to understand. But, and, and I still can't figure out how the Palestinians in Gaza, I don't understand why they elected Hamas as their governing entity. There are a lot of innocent people down there. Most of the people in the Gaza Strip are innocent people. And Jesus died for them. Let's remember that. By the way, Jesus died for Hamas. Jesus died for Hezbollah. Jesus died for the members, former members of ISIS. Jesus died for those people, and he wants to save all of those people. But ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, Israel, they are his chosen people. And we stand with them. We stand with them, and we better keep standing with them because the Abrahamic covenant is still very much intact. It's a unilateral, unconditional covenant where God said, I'll bless them that bless you, and I will. That ain't my saying. That's his saying. And it's absolutely, unequivocally true. And so as we're looking at this story, let's be reminded that God has a specific plan through specific people and through a specific land. And in this particular story, don't miss this, God is going to use, here's what's going to happen. Boaz is the kinsman redeemer. Boaz, he's worthy, he is wealthy, and he is willing. Can I tell you something about Jesus today? He is worthy. Somebody say amen. He's wealthy. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. But the greatest wealth that he has for my benefit is not the cattle on a thousand hills. The greatest wealth that he has is the righteousness of God himself. And through his death, burial, and resurrection, specifically his atoning blood, he has imputed the righteousness of himself. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't get any more wealthy than to have the righteousness of God imputed upon you. Because that means that you are forever redeemed. You are forever sealed. You are forever engaging in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, your Savior. And today, you are as sure in heaven as you are sitting right here. Amen? And so, as we look at this story, we see Boaz. What's he going to do? He's buying back what was lost. What has Jesus done for you? He's bought back your soul that was lost by the first Adam. We talked, we sang today about the second Adam, the last Adam. What do we know about the last Adam? Here's what we know. The last Adam fixed what the first Adam broke. The first Adam broke what God had originally created for us. And the last Adam, he showed up and said, I can fix that because I'm worthy. I'm the son of God. I'm wealthy. I own it all, and I possess the righteousness of God himself because I am God. But the big thing is this. Is he willing? And I am here to tell you today, he is. You say, how do you know? Because God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. No man takes his life. He laid down his life. And today we can stand in his presence and come boldly before the throne of God in the righteousness of the Almighty himself Because Jesus Christ is the propitiation. He satisfied the Father. He's my advocate. He stands with me. He stands with me with his blood. He calls the judge dad. It don't get any better than that. Amen. You know, as we clap today, let's realize what we're clapping for. We're not clapping for any man. We're clapping for Jesus. If you ever clap for anything other than that, Now, I'm not saying you can't clap for a performance if you're at a concert or something like that, but I'm talking about in a church setting, at the very heart of what we clap for is for Him. And if we can't clap for Him, we better not be clapping for anybody else or anything else. He's the only one who is worthy. He's the only one who's wealthy enough 
and he was the only one who was willing. And today, Jesus is my kinsman redeemer. Now, here's the beauty in this. Boaz and Ruth are going to have a little boy. His name's going to be Obed. You know what Obed means? Worship. He's a worshiper. Well, little Obed, he's going to have a little boy. You know what his name's going to be? Jesse. Jesse is going to have several boys. One of them is going to be David, the sweet singer of Israel. David is going to have several sons, but with Bathsheba, two very significant sons. One's name is Solomon, one's name is Nathan. Follow Solomon all the way to Matthew chapter 1. Follow Nathan all the way to Luke chapter 3. You have Joseph's genealogy. and You have Mary's genealogy. Ladies and gentlemen, let's be reminded today, Joseph is not Jesus' father. The Holy Spirit is Jesus' father that conceived within Mary a true virgin, the Son of God. And the Son of God, born of a virgin, born in Bethlehem, Ephrata, just as the Bible says, lived 33 sinless years, laid down his life on a cross as the one who is worthy, as the one who is wealthy, and as the one who is willing. Three days later, he got up from the grave, and because he got up, I love how that, Johnny, I, I'm not endorsing Johnny Cash, but I do like the song. He's getting up, I'm getting up too. Amen? He come out of the grave, I'm coming out too. And so today, I'll leave you with that. I am today so grateful that no matter what we face in life, he's worthy. He's wealthy. He's willing. This morning, you may have walked in here lost, undone. You might have walked in here and saying, Pastor John, and maybe even now, you say, I don't really understand all of this. Listen, in a nutshell, I say it succinctly and I say it as clearly as I can. Jesus loves you. He's the Son of God who took on a vesture of clay and died for you. And when he died for you, he put your sin to death. That sin that has stolen you away, he put it to death and he bought you back. He said, well, Pastor John, what do I do with that information? Well, here's what you understand. He didn't stay dead. He got up. He's seated at the right hand of God. He's coming back soon. Based on what we're seeing in Israel, maybe sooner than we think. Maybe sooner than we think. You say, well, Pastor John, what do I do with that? Here's what I would do if I was you. I would say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Holy Spirit, open my eyes, remove the scales. Holy Spirit, draw me to the Father. Through the death, burial, and resurrection, the gospel. And say, so I'm not sure he will. He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. See, when God says something, he means it. And today, he's your kinsman redeemer. He came as a man. He died a horrible death, spiritually and physically. But he didn't stay dead. He got up. And now he's seated at the right hand of the Father. And he's saying, come on. Come on. Come on. So today, I'm going to say the same thing to you. It's not my invitation. It's his. Come on. Come on. Come to him. He wants to save you. He paid your price. All you have to do is put your faith and trust in him. And all God's people said, Father, today, we're grateful for this Old Testament story that illustrates a New Testament fact. God, that a kinsman was worthy, willing, wealthy. Lord, I thank you that today we can look to you and know that you are worthy. You alone are worthy. There is no other. You alone are wealthy enough with the righteousness of God himself. Lord, you alone are willing to die for the sins of the world. Holy Spirit, today I ask you to do what I can't do. I can only deliver a message. I can't draw a soul. So Holy Spirit, this morning, there's somebody sitting here, somebody live streaming. They don't know you. They know about you. They don't know you. God, this is the day. This is their day. God, would you draw them to yourself? Would you remind them of the love of Christ? The one who did what no other one can do. Pay the penalty once and for all for sin. 
to say to tell us, die. It is finished. God, I can't thank you enough. I can't thank you enough. Let's stand together. This morning, our altar is always open for whatever you may want to talk to the Lord about. You can make your seat an altar. The most important thing that can happen today, though, is for you to come to know Jesus as your Savior. I'm going to be right over here to your left and my right. This morning, the Holy Spirit spoke to you. You just come see me and say, Pastor John, I want to know this Jesus. I, w- I want to have full confidence that I have a relationship with him and that heaven is my home. I can't save you. I can introduce you to the one who can. I'll be right here. For the rest of us, let's do this. What a great song. Is he worthy? How many of y'all know the answer? Yes. All right, so answer with us, okay, because we're going to be answering. This morning, is he worthy? The answer is yes, he is. Hey, and do this today, y'all. Do this today, y'all. Just throw your inhibitions aside, and this morning, just sing it from the top of your lungs. Just sing it from the top of your lungs. Just sing it out. Just raise the roof, man. Let's have a good time of worship right here. Is he worthy? And we know he is. He is. Do you mind if we do this this morning? Can I have everybody just come on down to the front? As we sing this song together, come on down here to the front. And let's sing it together as we declare that he is worthy. Fill in this area here too, y'all. Y'all, for whatever reason, y'all don't like this area. Come on. Come on, Terry. Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. But do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. And do you wish that you could see it all made new? Lift it up, church. We do. And is all creation groaning? It is. Is a new creation coming? It is. And is the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst? It is. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy of this? We know the answer. the truly love us He does Does the Spirit move among us He does And does Jesus our Messiah hold forever those He loves He does And does our God intend to dwell again with us Aren't you looking forward to it? Sing it out. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah.